So here is a photograph from the night of their canonization, May 12, 2017. The canonization of our church's youngest saints and newest saints, Saints Francisco and Jacinta. And here is a photograph from the day. But let's go back to Fatima now. When Our Lady appeared in, nine, in uh, May 13, she told the children, I will appear a seventh time. So a lot of people are not familiar with the seventh apparition. But it happened in February 15, 1921. The bishop asked Lucia to go up north to the city of Oporto, because in Fatima, she was a bit of a celebrity, right? Everybody wanted to be with her and touch her and talk to her. And he said, you go up there because there no one knows you yet. And she said yes to the bishop. But later on, she changed her mind. She began to feel homesick, a lot of sorrow in her heart, the memories at the Cova, at the Cabeso, at Valinhos, at all the places that she knew and loved where she saw Our Lady. And she said, no, I'm going to go back and tell him, I cannot go. So she ran out to the Cova, the Cova, the area where Our Lady appeared, and she prayed to Our Lady, who then appeared once more. And Lucia writes down in her diary, I felt your friendly and maternal hand touching me on the shoulder. I looked up and I saw you. It was you, the Blessed Mother, giving me a hand and showing me the way. Your voice brought back again light and peace to my soul. And her blessed mother said to her, here I am for the seventh time. Go, follow the path along which the bishop wants to take you. This is the will of God. And then Lucia writes in her memoirs, then I repeated my yes, now a yes much more conscious than that of May 13, 1917. That first appearance of Our Lady, do you remember? She asked the children a question. Are you willing to sacrifice? They all said, yes, we are willing. And here before Lucia is a great sacrifice that she has to make. And she repeats her yes once more. Ponte Vedra, Spain. This is the next Fatima apparition. In 1925, in the small cell of her room where she is postulant with the Dorothean sisters in Pontevedra, our Blessed Mother appears with the child Jesus. And she's holding in her hand again her immaculate heart crowned with thorns. And with her left hand, Our Lady puts her hand on Lucia's shoulder. And both the child Jesus and Mary speak. Have compassion on the heart of your most holy mother, Jesus says, covered with thorns, with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment. And there is no one to make an act of reparation to, to remove them. And then Our Lady, look, my daughter, at my heart, surrounded with thorns. Again, ungrateful men pierce me at every moment by blasphemies, by ingratitude, you at least try to console me. So our Blessed Mother knows when we console her, each of us can make a difference. And then this is the time when heaven asks for the five first Saturday devotions. This is the forgotten part of the Fatima message. And so it's a good time now to be reminded. Our Lady said, say that I promise to assist at the hour of death with all the graces necessary for salvation. All those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months shall one, go to confession, receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the rosary, and finally, keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the mysteries of the rosary with the intention of making reparation to me. Jesus tells Lucia later on that many people make this devotion, but they forget to make the intention of consoling Mary. They're doing it to obtain the promise, which is still a good thing. But he said, I prefer that they uh, make the intention to console my mother. Now the church has expanded the first Saturday confession to the whole month, so now you can go anywhere, anytime in that month. What Our Lady is encouraging is monthly confession. That's the whole point, to grow in holiness and to receive Jesus worthily. And Lucia also says, it is not necessary 
to meditate on all the mysteries of the rosary. Even one will do, as long as we go deeply into the mystery and we contemplate the lives of Jesus and Mary and how they lived, how they acted, how they were uh, during the trials of life, joyful, sorrowful, glorious, or luminous. Then we have now the final official Fatima apparition, which happens in Tui, Spain. The date is June 13, 1929. Lucia is making her holy hour, which she does every night, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight. And it's very dark in the chapel. And all of a sudden, the whole chapel lights up. And what she sees visually no, is her favorite prayer of all, the Trinity prayer taught to her by the angel, most holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here you see the Father with his arms open and on his chest, above his heart, the Holy Spirit. And below we have Jesus on the cross. And from his crowned head and his pierced heart, there are drops of blood falling into a holy Eucharist, a host, and the host is above a chalice. And on his side, beneath the arms of the cross, is our Blessed Mother, and she's holding her Immaculate Heart in flames and crowned with thorns. And on the other side of Jesus' hand, grace and mercy, grace and mercy. And so Fatima is a message of mercy. It begins with mercy, when the angel appears, he told the children, God has designs of mercy on you, and it ends with mercy. Lucia received many, many lights about the Holy Trinity during this apparition, but she said, I am not allowed to reveal them. But what she saw in this apparition also was what happens at every Holy Mass. In every Mass, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is united with the suffering heart of His Mother. And together, through the Holy Spirit, they offer it to the Eternal Father. And the Eternal Father, in turn, accepts the sacrifice. And again, through the Holy Spirit, He pours out grace and mercy on the entire world at every single mass, 350,000 times in one day. That's how many masses are celebrated. Um, Lucia asked Jesus, oh, sorry, this is the apparition when they come to ask for the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The moment has come in which God asks the Holy Father to make in union with all the bishops of the world the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, promising to save it by this means. And Lucia asks our Lord, why don't you just convert Russia? Why do you have to have Russia consecrated to the heart of Mary? And this is Jesus' answer, because I want my whole church to acknowledge that consecration as a triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in order to later extend its practice and to place this devotion to the Immaculate Heart right alongside devotion to my sacred heart. So he wants devotion to the sacred and immaculate hearts on an equal plane together. St. John Eudes said that the two hearts, the two sacred hearts, Mary and Jesus's, are one heart. They beat us one. January 25 to 26, 1938. Remember Our Lady said, when you see a night illumined by a light, a strange light, know that this is the sign that God is about to punish the world for its crimes. And so there's an original newspaper clipping, two of them. People in Europe thought the world was on fire. This was, um, ha took place from 8.45 in the evening to 1.15 in the morning. And Lucia came out of her convent in now Galicia, Spain, and she said, this is the sign, and she knew that the war was near. It was seen in Italy, Spain, Gibraltar, Austria, Switzerland, and even Pope Pius XI saw it in Rome. And do you remember Pope Pius XI? Our Lady said, a worse war will happen under his reign if man does not stop offending God. So he is now the Pope after Benedict XV, and now we have the sign. The New York Times the next day writes about it. You can see on the right hand side, Aurora Borealis startles Europe. People flee in fear, calling firemen. And two months later, Germany annexes Austria and World War II 
begins. World War II was worse, Lucia said, not only because of more deaths, but because it was aimed at the destruction of the Jewish people. The Jewish people who gave us Jesus, Mary, Joseph, the apostles. 70 to 85 million deaths. Our Lady said this was all preventable. To prevent this, I am coming to ask two things, right? Consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, communion of reparation of the first Saturdays. We did not listen to her. Man kept offending God. And towards the end of the war, August 6, 1945, little boy, the name of the first nuclear bomb, dropped in Hiroshima, instantly killing 70 to 80,000 people. Within four more months, 90,000 more died from terrible prolonged deaths, no? from severe burns, radiation exposure, cancer, poisoning, starvation. All in all, 237,000 people were killed, and 90% of the city was wiped out. This is a photo of Hiroshima after. If you look at the church in the foreground, you will see four or five figures dressed in black. Can you see? If you can see, there are four or five men dressed in black in the road right in front of the church. There were eight Jesuit priests that survived the nuclear bomb detonation. They were eight blocks away from where the bomb exploded. All of them die in old age of natural deaths. None of them had radiation exposure. Absolutely incredible, because for miles and miles around, people were dying of radiation exposure and poisoning. One of the priests was Father Pedro Arupe. If you're Jesuit, you probably know him because he was the superior general of the Jesuits for many years. The spokesperson for the eight Jesuits was Father Hubert Schiffer. He was medically examined over 200 times, interviewed over and over, and asked, how did you survive? You have a picture of him there with Major Robert Lewis, the co-pilot of the Enola Gray, the Boeing bomber that dropped the bomb. Father Schiffer wrote a book called The, the Rosary of Hiroshima. You can see it on the screen trying to explain why he thought they survived. But basically, in every interview, this is what he said. We believe that we survived because we were living the message of Fatima. We lived and prayed the rosary daily in that home. Prayer is more powerful than the atom bomb. Three days later, August 9, 1945, another atomic bomb over the city of Nagasaki the bomb called Fat Man, 80,000 deaths immediately. Nagasaki had two-thirds of the Catholics in Japan who were persecuted for centuries. The first Filipino saint, San Lorenzo Ruiz, was martyred, one of the Nagasaki martyrs, many years before. And they had built this beautiful cathedral that you see on your right. The bomb exploded right above that cathedral, the Cathedral of St. Mary, that seated 5,000 people. Large, the largest cathedral of its kind in the whole of Asia. It took them 30 years to build, and the year after it was finished, it was destroyed by the bomb. Pope Pius XII celebrated a mass there in the cathedral ruins, four years after the war ended. The emperor surrendered on August 15, the feast of Our Lady of the Assumption, and that was the official end of the war. But it took two nuclear bombs. That cathedral is rebuilt today, you see on your left, and miraculously, the head of Our Lady survived the nuclear blast. Her glass eyes were melted in the heat, her head is left intact, and she is in a special chapel inside that cathedral. Also what survived, amazingly, is the Garden of the Immaculata, the largest Franciscan friary founded by Maximilian Kolbe, who spent the years 1930 to 36 in Nagasaki. He had died four years earlier in the concentration camp of Auschwitz. 